this is again our second event in the Black Culture Matters series. My name is Dr. Ieli Ichile, and this is an event co-hosted by the African American Studies Institute, sponsored by the Maryland uh, Humanities and the Prince George's Community College Humanities, English, and Social Sciences Division. I want to give a special thanks to Nicole Courier, our dean. Uh, I also want to give a special shout out and thanks to Corey Brown, the chair of my department, uh, the Social Sciences Department. Uh, I want to, before I introduce everyone involved further, I would like to pour libation. And, and since we don't have all the materials and supplies and we're living together today in the digital, I would like to just offer a verbal libation as I did last time. Um, I want to just speak some words to set our intention for the evening. In the tradition of our ancestors, uh, in the tradition of our African ancestors and their descendants out here in the diaspora, we would like to in set our intention and our energy tonight to bring folks together in the spirit of growth, in the spirit of intellectual engagement, in the spirit of cultural appreciation, uh, in the spirit of freedom and liberation through connection, through beauty, through tradition. I would like to lift the spirit in the name of Nina Simone because her passion and her integrity and her unapologetic commitment to her people and to her craft is certainly a core theme uh, and a core energy that we would like to engage with as we talk about black hair care um, and culture and mental health this evening. Uh, let our words be strong medicine, not just my words and the words of our wonderful guest speaker, but also the words of all of you, the community that joins with us, that raises important questions and ideas in our chat and our dialogue. Uh, this medicine, let this medicine really kind of move out beyond just this space, but into our lives and our community. All of us who have hair, all of us who don't have hair, all of us who interact with people with hair and interact with people with hearts and minds and spirits, that, that we get something from tonight, something from this conversation that helps us to be better at our work, more sensitive and thoughtful in the work that we do. Uh, so we say all of that in the name of all that is honorable and great. Ashe. I would like to first introduce myself. My name again is Dr. Iyeli Chile. I am a professor of history in the Department of Social Sciences here at Prince George's Community College in Maryland. Uh, I teach African diaspora studies, African American studies, African American history, and continental African history. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you once again. This is just been the most amazing process and the most amazing introduction into my new role as the director of the African American Studies Institute. Uh, I would like to really quickly read you the mission statement of the African American Studies Institute at Prince George's Community College. The mission of the African American Studies Institute at PGCC is to facilitate the critical study of the realities and possibilities of people of African descent, both in and beyond the Prince George's community uh, Prince George's County Learning Community. Anchored in the Division of the Humanities, English, and Social Sciences at PGCC, the AASI engages in digital research, educational programs, research, and community partnerships. Our primary goal is to create spaces in which Black life ways are affirmed, justice is a top priority, and healthy futures are envisioned. I also would like to dedicate tonight's event to the memory and the justice that we seek for Breonna Taylor. Um, some disclaimers, um, being that some of what we will be talking about tonight is social, is culture, is political, and comes from um, kind of a, a decided set of perspectives um, that, that our guest speaker brings, that you all in the community brings, I would like to just make the statement that none of what is said um, this evening necessarily reflects the views of Maryland Humanities, the Maryland Historical Trust, the Maryland Department of Planning, or Prince George's Community College uh, writ large. Now, that said, I would like to introduce our speaker. Our guest speaker for tonight is Dr. Afia Mbili Shaka. She's a therapist, a professor, a research scientist, and a hairstylist. 
She is the owner of Ma'at Psychological Services, a private practice in Washington, D.C., focused on promoting balance and restoring order to the lives of her clients. She is a soon-to-be tenured associate professor of psychology at the University of the District of Columbia, who focuses on understanding and using traditional African cultural rituals for contemporary holistic mental health practices. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, and she also earned a PhD in clinical psychology from Howard University at the age of 26. Dr. Afia, as she's called by her community, innovated the practice and research of psychotherapy, where she uses hair as an entry point for mental health services in beauty salons and barbershops, as well as through social media. She's the principal investigator of the psychotherapy research lab and has been a research advisor to over 30 students. She has now gone international, leading cultural and mental health focused trips to Cuba and to various African countries. She is the former Association of Black Psychologists DC chapter president and a natural hairstylist at In Natural Hair Studio in Silver Spring, Maryland, where she loves creating art with locks, twists, and afros. You may have also seen Dr. Fia on Good Morning America just last Friday discussing the natural hair movement. On a personal note, I know Dr. Fia to be a prolific writer and a supportive research partner and just a fabulous colleague. Black hair is a topic that is near and dear to both of our hearts, so I'm happy to share her with all of you this evening. Before we begin, I'm going to uh, just kind of run down briefly what will happen. After Dr. Fia's lecture, I'm going to ask her to respond to an image of my choosing related to this topic of hair. Uh, she doesn't know what the image is, but she'll be asked to kind of speak uh, extemporaneously about the image, just briefly, and then we'll open up the chat so all of you can engage with her and we can have a dialogue. So get your questions and comments ready. And without further ado, Dr. Afia. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Ichile. I appreciate the invitation to participate in such a meaningful experience and event. Um, you know, I was over here praying and meditating as you spoke, uh, and so I think that tonight's experience will truly be healing. Um, but I always um, believe in greeting properly, and so will, will you practice unmute yourself, Dr. Ichile, so you can practice my language skills with me? Please okay. can you talk to me. Okay. All right. I always like to greet based on the places that I've been to in Africa. And so I need somebody to speak back with me. So um, the first time I went to Africa, I went to Ghana and there amongst the tree speaking people, we would say, well, hold to sing. Well, hold to sing. Perfect. <laughs> All right. The next time I went, um, I went to Nigeria and stayed with a Yoruba family. And there we would greet by saying, Bawoni. Bawoni. Perfect. You got the tones. You, you are there. You're, you're Nigerian blood. Um, the next time I went, I went to um, Kenya. And there we would greet by saying, Habaragani. Habaragani. Like Kwanzaa. You have to <laughs> do All right. I like that. Um, the last time I went to Africa, I went to South Africa. And there amongst the Zulu people, we would say, Salbona. Salbona. Perfect. And since we're both in Maryland right now, yo, what's up? So what's I'm up? What's up, Mo? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So, so I really am honored again, and thank you for practicing that, right? Because I don't want to talk to myself. Um, so I appreciate the conversation. So I hope even though we're all in these different locations, we can engage in conversation tonight through the chat or other medium. So I'm going to share, with you, share my PowerPoint uh, with you right now. And uh, let's keep going. Okay. All right. So tonight I will be talking about psychotherapy, but with the subtitle of Black Heritage, History and Healing. So I don't know if you all have heard of the term psychotherapy before. Um, if somebody else is talking about it, that's not the legit stuff. This is the real thing. Psychotherapy. I made the word, word up, right? Once you get a PhD, you can start making up new words. So it's trademarked, copyrighted, um, now even has an LLC. But this um, idea came to me when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. I love doing people's hair. And I would have these little pop-up salons in my dorm room. I never charge people. I just love the art of doing hair. And I was a psychology major and I remember talking to my Aunt Brenda on the phone one day who she's now an ancestor and telling her, 
should I study hair or should I study psychology? And so she said, well, why can't you do both? I don't know if she meant for me to do the both at the same exact time, but that's the way I interpreted it and thought, hmm, I can do hair and psychology work together. So that's my little origin story of that term. But um, even going into these proverbs, I think are, are very important. If in the chat, can you all write, what is the name of this hairstyle? What is the name of this hairstyle? I know you all know what this hairstyle is, but I just wanna make sure that, that um, we, we're, we're working with the same language. Okay, let me pull up the chat to see you all writing in there. Uh, all right, so, so we got Bantu knots, exactly. But everybody's writing Bantu knots a million times, good. But who are the Bantu people? Who are the Bantu people? Well, my understanding of the Bantu people is that um, <laughs> they are, or it's called China Bumps too, from Jamaica, <laughs> of the Bantu people are the second largest ethnic group in Africa and migrators. Um, so even that's your people, right, Nadari? Um, and so I always think about, we might not know that this is actually where the majority of enslaved Africans um, originate from in terms of ethnic group that came to the Caribbean, the Americas and South America, but that the hairstyle remains. So no matter how far the river, river travels, it never forgets its source. So although we might not know who we are, or where we came from specifically, our hair will never forget. All right, so in terms of the objectives for today, I hope to comb through Black hair history, lock the connection between hair and health, and braid together strategies for affirming Black culture. All right, so you see what I was trying to do there and have these hair-related uh, <laughs> object objectives here. Uh, so let's get started. I'm going to begin where everything began, in Africa. Um, I'm going to basically tell a hair story to you, telling history through hair. And so in traditional African societies, um, hair was a sophisticated language system. It could communicate your age, marital status, spiritual system, your, your wealth, all of these different factors just by the hairstyle that was worn. And specifically, hair was connected to healing rituals at all points in the life story. So I'm gonna focus here on the Maasai for a little bit to tell some of their rituals. And I like to define rituals as a way that um, we prepare our mind, body, and spirit to receive a certain blessing. Okay, questions or comments? Okay. <laughs> to prepare our mind, body, or spirit to receive a blessing. So here is a Maasai um, mother and child. Uh, um, and the Maasai live in today's Kenya and Tanzania. And in this image, if you look very closely, the baby's hair is actually getting shaved with a razor blade. This is a naming ceremony. So about seven to 10 days, after a baby is born, they get their name. Because in a lot of traditional African societies, in one's name is inscribed one's life journey. Um, so for example, my name is Afia. If we use the Kiswahili version of it, it means health. And so every time my name is called, it is reminding me of my purpose and mission in this life. And so the Maasai also believe that as well as, as, well as other ethnic groups around the continent of Africa, that they actually will shave the hair of the baby and of the mother to signify this transition from a spiritual relationship to one that is physical. And hair is a offering or sacrifice made for the safety of the child throughout their life. And then here are Maasai warriors. Maybe you've heard of them at different points in your life, but they are known throughout the world as being powerful and strategic, as well as having beautiful hair. So in order to become a Maasai warrior, you actually have to grow locks. And so we can tell the length of time that someone's been a warrior based on the length of his hair. And they also use different um, minerals and clays from the earth to dye their hair that bright red color in a sense to evoke warrior deities and energy of fire and blood to prepare them to fight. Um, also, in order to become a Maasai warrior, you have to do other initiations, such as killing a lion. 
Now, I'm not saying this is some, you know, Facebook post, I killed a lion, but it's actually thinking about how to protect the community. Because in this area of the Maasai Mara, where the Maasai are living in this image, that there are lions roaming or, or around this space and to protect the community and to have strategy. So even thinking about the best time to capture a lion, the be best weapons to use, um, and how to work together as a team to be able to achieve that task. And so um, again, hair signifies their warriorhood and specifically their locks. And so it's interesting because once a Maasai warrior has completed his task um, of fighting, he has to get his hair shaved. And so he gets his hair shaved with milk um, in particular. And there's only one person in the entire community that can shave the hair of the warrior when he returns. Who do you think that might be? You can write that into the chat of who you think is the only person who is allowed to shave his hair. And again, the whole community comes together and there is this cleansing, cleansing process. All right, I see it, the mom, his mother, correct, his mother. And so it's representing a rebirth process, right? Just like for the naming ceremony, then the mother and the baby gets their hair shaved, but this also happens in returning because as you know, wars and fighting can do something to the psyche. And so having this rebirth process allows the person to sort of rid some of the trauma that they experience. Imagine that we did this for warriors who came back from various wars around the world, had the community come together. Maybe there will be lower rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, or maybe think about what if we did this ritual for brothers returning from incarceration, where the whole community came together and shaved them and cleansed them with milk and other and engaged in other rituals, and even thinking about their mother being involved in that rebirth process. Again, rituals were are so critical to um, traditional African societies because it's so healing, and this is the healing we need. Um, here are some images of brides throughout the African continent. Um, and so on wedding days, there are often rituals because someone needs to communicate to others they are no longer available. So the Maasai bride is actually to the left. She did something I did not do on my wedding day. She shaved her hair. So I don't know if you all have seen, I'm thinking most of you have seen Waiting to Exhale or other things like that. Sometimes when we have a breakup or start a new relationship, we just have to shave it all off because there's a lot of energy and especially romantic energy in our hair. I did a research study and found that a lot of Black women in particular tend to cut their hair when they break up when they go through a divorce or end a romantic relationship. So for her wedding day, she shaves her head, representing, again, that fresh start. Um, the woman in the middle is from the Mauritanian desert. And instead of wedding guests bringing gifts or cards, they actually do the bride's hair. So they twist it and braid it and put different beads in it to wish positive things for the marriage. So they, some of the beads can represent fertility, some can represent wealth. And so they, again, collectively do the bride's hair for her wedding day. Or even the woman to the right, she is a Turig woman of um, today's Mali and Niger. And she is getting her hair done for her wedding day. And she's getting her hair done, rubbed with very specific um, medicinal oils as well as fine black sand. She's actually getting her hair rubbed with sand to make it shinier. And there's only one person in her entire community who was allowed to actually braid her hair on her wedding day. It is the blacksmith's wife. Basically, they wanna make sure that that marriage is hot. <laughs> you wanna make sure to have a hot marriage. So thinking about that heat and energy. Hair is also important in a lot of traditional African societies because of how we adorn it. Oftentimes we put things into our hair to enhance its beauty. So this woman to the left, she has um, bottle caps and it even looks like a watch band um, in, the, in her hair. And then the woman to the right, well, she has some serious cornrows. <laughs> okay, yeah, you didn't think that was funny? It was too corny, too corny, okay. <laughs> you know, I gotta practice my stand-up career. But a lot of, <laughs> thank you for laughing. Thank you for laughing, Kendra Lee. Um, but uh, we have to really think about how hair is connected to medicine. So in the image to the right is a, um, 
something from ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. And these people are seeking support and healing services from a traditional healer or priest. And so oftentimes people will go to these healers and give their different symptoms of what was going on in their body. And they would come up with a specialized medicine mixing together various plants and animal fats, putting it on the top of the person's head. And because of the heat of the day, it would melt into the scalp and basically into the bloodstream, addressing the health issue that the person had. So um, this concept basically links to how the blood vessels are set up underneath the skin and the scalp. So anything that you put on your hair and on your skin, you should be able to eat. Again, I'm going to say this. Anything that you put on your hair and on your skin, you should be able to eat. And so, um, again, almost if you apply something topically, it can actually get into your bloodstream faster than if you were to eat it and digest it. So our, you know, ancestors understood that connection. And so even today in, um, for the Himba people of Namibia, they cover their hair with various clays and butters. And even the people of Ethiopia use butter to style their hair correct. And so, um, but you know, Shea Moisture hasn't caught up with this to use food <laughs> as hair products. But putting that clay on the hair actually prevents breakage. Um, so at the salon that I work with in Silver Spring, I have not been there in months, but if someone is experiencing a lot of breakage, we will actually cover their entire scalp and hair with clay, put them under the dryer with various essential oils, wash it out, and they do report having less breakage in their hair. So actually applying things that the body can process and doesn't cause um, side effects. So even to have a medicinal moment right now, what are people putting on their hair? I want to see in the chat, what do you apply to your hair that you find to be medicinal? Again, I, I argue that anything that you put on your hair and your skin, you should be able to eat. All right, you've done butter, all right, castor oil, coconut oil, shea butter, argan oil, aloe. Okay, people, are, coconut oil, yes. Oh, Aztec clay and coconut oil, olive oil. All right, Indian healing clay, olive oil, beer. Okay, I've seen turmeric, yes, turmeric. All right, Jamaican castor oil, extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, peppermint, lavender oil, gelatin. Okay, hemp oil, pepper, oh, pepper, eggs, rice water, yes, yes. Um, raw honey, vitamin E, eggs. Anybody ever do apple cider vinegar? Um, anybody do avocados themselves, bananas? Um, all right, sandalwood. Ooh, that, that smells good. Uh, <laughs> different vinegars, right? So to recognize, again, anything that you put on your hair and your skin, you should be able to eat. Okay, I see somebody put aloe. I have my aloe plant right here. Sometimes I break off parts to make a gel for my hair. Um, if with fresh braids. Okay, you, make, you all have some good recipes going on. Uh, <laughs> so again, we're still following these traditions, but again, to think about what our bodies can actually process, they say the healthiest hair products are in the produce section of the supermarket, that you should be able to refrigerate your hair products um, to have the least amount of side effects. All right, yeah, and even thinking about, again, these traditions of hair care um, going way back. We can look at this proverb, this Ghanaian proverb, when your sister is your hairdresser, you need no mirror. Again, when your sister is your hairdresser, you need no mirror. I've heard the, the um, other sense that when your brother is your barber, you need no mirror, but it speaks to the amount of trust that you have with the people who are doing your hair. You, you don't, I don't even need to look in a mirror because I know you're gonna make me look good. So that, that uh, the hairstylist or the barber had a very, high status in a lot of traditional societies and even today right we trust our stylists and barbers with information that maybe we haven't even shared with our family members or close relationships but it's interesting because oftentimes these traditional stylists or barbers use very few tools they had uh, maybe some palm oil years of creativity <laughs> and carved wooden combs so in a lot of tr traditional West African societies, comb culture was actually medicinal as well. So let's say that someone was having financial trouble. I know that, you know, I'm sure most of us could use more money. I, I could take more money. 
So let's say you had some financial issues. You tell the stylist or barber, they get a very special comb carved, comb your hair with it, and you'd end up getting money. Or let's say that you were having fertility issues. So this is a actual, ugh, this is a fertility doll, and I have a comb like that, a fertility doll um, comb carved into the comb. And so if someone was having fertility issues, they would actually get their hair combed with the special comb and somehow get pregnant and have lots of children. So um, wood, I guess, would be considered healthier than some of the plastic um, combs that exist now. Um, I think that, you know, just again, going to these more earth and plant-based products, even for our combs as well. So there are so many different things that we can do with our hair, but it's embedded in a lot of relational cultures. Um, so for example, uh, for the Wolof people in Senegal, everyone inherits their barber or hairstylist. So you go to the same stylist that your family went to. And to some degree, the stylists become griots or jollies, keeping the stories of the family. Or for the Mende people, offering to style someone's hair is an offering of friendship because you know you'll spend hours and hours and hours and hours um, with that person, um, telling stories and getting to know them. Or even for the Yoruba people, um, every single girl is taught how to braid hair, but anyone who shows particular talent becomes the master braider for their community, braiding everyone's hair. So it's a huge role and responsibility. And there are a lot of taboos associated with it as well. Like you can never um, underpay your stylist because for the Yoruba, it's understood that they are holding your head, your ori, your destinies. So you would never want to shortchange a stylist or try to negotiate a price with them because that person is a keeper of your ori. So you wouldn't want them to keep some of your blessings from you. So there's lots of rules actually in the Yoruba culture around hair braiding. All right, but there's not one type of African, just like there's not one type of African hair. But what's common amongst them all is that every single strand is beautiful. But unfortunately, one of the first things that European and Arab slave catchers and masters did was to shave the hair of their new human cargo upon entry into the boats. So I just spent all this time talking about how hair has spiritual significance, relational significance, health significance, all of these different factors, and within seconds and minutes destroying that connection. There's a really good book by Willie Morrow called 400 Years Without a Comb that basically describes as, um, as Black people became disconnected with their hair rituals, they got disconnected from African culture. And so often times we see these images of enslaved Africans with scarves on their heads or hats. This wasn't necessarily a fashion statement, but it was a way to protect themselves um, from the sun. But also there was a lot of hair loss. Even today, about 47% of Black women experience hair loss at some point in their lifetime. That's really high. And when we think about our enslaved African ancestors, poor nutrition, extreme levels of stress, and poor living conditions, resulted in hair loss, scalp diseases, and ringworm, lice. You know, oftentimes we say black hair can have lice, but if you're living in conditions like an animal, then that can also be a factor. So one of the dehumanizing techniques that um, slave monsters, I mean, slave masters did was um, call, calling black people's hair wool or fur as a way to dehumanize if they saw them as an animal then they were treated as such. And oftentimes we didn't have the proper oils or combs that we had in tradition and had to use the tools for sheep or horses on our hair as a means to take care of ourselves. But I don't wanna pit, paint a negative story because there's always stories of resistance, right? Our African ancestors fought back. And so if you ever study the history of the Maroons, Quilombo, Sea Maroons, that we know that there was resistance during these times of enslavement. And so I just want to even highlight, maybe you all have heard of this before, um, 
that our ancestors were actually able to braid maps into their hair to find these free or sovereign spaces. So you see the, the image to the left of the various braided styles of the black girls and the image to the right is actually a map from the 1700s. So we could actually replicate maps through our scalp. And so if people were running, um, that there were actually messages. And if they ever got caught, they unbraided their hair. They were destroying the maps. And so to even think about um, how African people were able to find sovereignty and um, resistance through the hair. And I've had kids um, look at this slide, but it's like, but what if they were running by themselves? But you know, you could actually feel your scalp. So okay, turn right, at the mountains or left at the water you could it was so tactile and so to really think about the genius of our african ancestors again finding liberation through hair all right we got some maroons in here but you know the american politics is always trying to control hair so there are laws even to this day about how black people can and can't wear their hair whether the military or in schools or employment um, and of course, we're trying to have other laws and rules to counter that, but some early ones, for example, in Louisiana were the Tignon laws. It was actually outlawed for Black women to show their hair in public spaces. Some say because it was seen as ugly or unattractive, but we really know it was so beautiful and it was tempting white men to um, be overly attracted to Black women, so they say cover it up. But considering how black women work with head wraps. They were creating some of the most beautiful <laughs> styles, Erica Badu height head wrap styles. And then that became outlawed because it was just so beautiful and white women couldn't replicate it. So to even think about, there's always this political um, part of hair care and hairstyling for black people in the US in particular. Um, but two, there, there's tons of information about how black hair was used for economic gains. I don't know if you all have seen um, Self Made on Netflix. I, I don't recommend it. But if you watch it, I have a whole critique of it on my Instagram account, uh, Dr. Fia on Instagram. But um, <laughs> basically, I feel like that, that there was such power and movement and economic gain if we really focus on hair health. That was the agenda of Annie Malone, of Adam C.J. Walker, where they actually focused on caring for their hair hair health. So Annie Malone, um, she came up with different scientific formulas to address ha healthy hair and actually named her products Poro after um, a secret society um, in Africa, I think specifically uh, Sierra Leone. Um, and then Madam C.J. Walker, born Sarah Breadlove, you know, oftentimes she's associated with being the first black millionaire or creating a hot comb, which she did not create. She just suggested to widen the teeth on the hot comb to get it through black hair. But her whole agenda was about repairing hair loss. Um, so she was born the first person in her family to be free. Um, her parents were enslaved. And by the age of six, both of her parents died. She was an orphan. Um, and so she actually moved to the Midwest with her sister by the age of 17. She was a widow and a single mother. Her husband actually was lynched in a race riot. And um, so she, her hair, she, she actually was a domestic and her hair started falling out. She was facing extreme stress, grief, loss. Um, and basically she had a dream one night and in her dream, an African man came to her and told her, if you want to grow your hair back, you have to get these very specific plants from Africa. She woke up, ordered the products. They came a few weeks later. She mixed different recipes together in her kitchen. She applied it to her scalp and it worked. It grew her hair back. And since again, 47% of black women today are experiencing hair loss and even higher back then, she started sharing with family and friends and it was growing their hair back too. And so um, she again used hair for economic empowerment. They say at the time of her death, she employed over 100,000 Black women, right? Even Oprah doesn't do that. Michelle Obama doesn't do that. Kamala Harris doesn't do that. So to think about how she really um, uplifted Black women through offering employment opportunities. 
But, you know, going into the 1960s and 70s, people went from Negro and color to Black and African. And with this change of consciousness, there was a change of, of aesthetic. Um, you know, let me get a good Black is beautiful in there. Let me get it in the chat. Can I get some Black is beautiful in that chat? Uh, <laughs> I want to see that. Yeah, and so oftentimes the, the image of, you know, Black Panther Party members, are with huge, beautiful Afros. And the majority of the people were women. Um, and again, showing resistance through hair. But if we all have social media accounts, we've probably seen lots of these stories um, about children in particular being harmed in school because of their hairstyles. Uh, for example, Deanna and Maya Scott were twins in Massachusetts that were suspended for having box braids. They couldn't go to the prom. They couldn't play in sports because they had braids. Um, Zaleika Patel in South Africa, she wanted to wear an Afro to school and actually was in her school book that you have to wear straight hair in Africa. Um, or Vanessa Van Dyke at the bottom, she was um, in school and getting bullied. Um, kids were making fun of her because her hair was so big. She went to the principal's office to tell them the other children and she got suspended because they said she was a distraction to the other children based on her hair. And so we know that there's been a lot of attention on this and um, rules and laws that have been coming up. And all of this is oftentimes founded in these beauty myths, right? That, that these Western um, approaches of long straight hair, light skin, small lips, nose, eyes, wide eyes, that is perpetuated, but it's a myth. It's not true. That is not what beauty is. And so oftentimes a lot of us have experienced aesthetic trauma. So again, you can make up terms when you get this PhD thing, right, Dr. Ichile? So aesthetic trauma, I, I try to coin this. Um, so aesthetic concern with beauty and trauma, deeply distressing or disturbing experience, put it together, a deeply distressing or, or disturbing experience concerning beauty. So if someone speaks about our hair, our skin, our body type, our lips, our nose, our eyes, that this is actually wounding. Um, so it's, it's interesting because you know, there's a lot of images of Black men um, experiencing violence, but I think that a lot of Black women experience these forms of aesthetic trauma all the time that can last for years and years um, that can impact our mental health. Even this concept of hair stress is defined as the physical and psychological effects of persistent and improper hair care styling practices used to transform the hair from its natural authentic state to achieve and maintain an unnatural texture and style. Now I'm not saying team natural versus not team natural, but even um, wanting our, our uh, edges to be laid can speak to hair stress. Why is it bad um, to, to have, as Beyonce was talking about, let it, let it shrivel up, right? So, um, but some people are putting certain things in their body, right? I was saying earlier, anything you put on your skin and your hair, you should be able to eat. And so um, oftentimes we're using endocrine disruptors. So if we look at our hair products, that it's actually impacting our hormone system. There's different research studies. If, you, if two to eight year old black girls tried products that had placenta containing material in it, they prematurely developed breasts and pubic hair. So again, thinking about our, how our hair products could actually be impacting us. Or even there's research coming from morticians that said when they were preparing black women's bodies for burial and they would pull back the scalp, there would be this green slime on the skull from years of chemical use and product buildup. So it's actually, you know, impacting our health on such deep levels. And so I do think that it can connect to the concept of um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, because I don't know about you all, but I never heard of um, us getting free therapy sessions after enslavement ended or after Jim Crow or Black Codes or even right now. We're not even getting free therapy now. It's not like, when slavery ended, they said, okay, everybody gets 40 therapy sessions in a mule, right? Okay, I don't know if that's funny, but in terms of thinking about, we've, we've really um, missed opportunities, but there's multi-generational trauma together with continued oppression. The absence of opportunities to heal or access the benefits available in society, which ultimately can lead to post-traumatic slave syndrome. And oftentimes I think that it manifests in how we style our hair and take care of our bodies such as the concept of vacant self-esteem, that we value ourselves on things that aren't really that important or ever-present anger. I don't know how many people in this group have ever taken the 70 bus um, in DC or other 
trains or buses but if you look at if you know if you stare at certain black people too long that they will fight you that there's this um trauma or it's almost reflexive and then racist socialization so i don't know about you all but do you remember as a kid for picture day when they would give you those little tiny combs and it, you could really have a complex, like, what am I supposed to do with this little comb? Like, I can't get it through in here. But that's even a concept of racial, racist socialization, the expectation. And even, I don't know if you've heard about, like, the um, comb test that they used to, and they used to hang um, combs on the front of different sororities or um, churches in the past, that if you couldn't get your hair through this comb easily, that you weren't allowed to come into that space. So to, again, thinking about how hair even shaped our access to things. So I've been studying this intensely um, through the Hair Health and Heritage Study, where I had over 300 participants, gave them mental health inventories, gave them inventories on um, physical health, and asked about hair stories. So for example, I developed something called the Guided Hair Autobiography. So basically the guided hair autobiography is how do you tell your life story through hair? Maybe your earliest memory, the first story you can think about in terms of hair, a low point on a deer, the worst thing that ever happened to you related to hair, or maybe even turning a point. Where was a time in your life story where something really shifted because you changed the way that you wore your hair? Um, and so this all contributes to my development of um, psychotherapy. So psychotherapy is basically using um, stylists and barbers as lay health advisors to um, address mental health needs through assessments and interve interventions, having therapists based in the salon, having group therapy in the salon barbershop space, psychoeducational materials and workshops in there, and then also web-based interventions, since a lot of us are not going to salons and barbershops these days, but utilizing maybe beauty influencers to perpetuate certain healing messages to communities. And so it really makes us question, well, what is mental health and how can that even relate to our hair? So I have a few definitions of mental health here that guide my approach. I like to use Dr. Thomas Parham's definition um, to be in touch with your spiritual essence, knowledge of self as a cultural being, having access to support and living your life in order, or even um, Farrakhan, he came and spoke to the Association of Black Psychologists in 1996. And he said, mental health is living in accord with the nature, aim, and purpose of one's creation. Or even the great um, ancestor Fukiao, he argued that mental health is balance or harmony with oneself, one's environment, and the universe. And so I like to have that guide us and even thinking about, well, what um, are the needs for a new mental health paradigm? Who can heal? Where can healing take place? Um, and even thinking, why do 50% of Black clients that go to therapy never return after their first appointment? Again, thinking that 50% of Black people go to therapy, try it out, take the risk to try it, actually never return. And so I want to address that and to think about actually the hair care spaces and informal support system and network that can actually address some of our mental health needs and thinking about why this is ideal for mental health services and the trust and the rapport that exists already between hair care professionals and stylists. So, all right. A lot of times people ask me what products I use for my hair. I give answers, but... I also say that it's a particular lifestyle. So just to get a health assessment of people who are, are participating today, let me get a, a me in the chat. How many people are eating between four to five servings of fruits and vegetables a day? Can I get a me in there? Can I get a me in the chat? All right. All right, getting those fruits and vegetables, right? Because we have to be able to build healthy hair from inside. All right. How many people are drinking at least eight glasses of water or eight cups of water a day. All right, so high, people are hydrated. All right, how many people are sleeping between seven to nine hours a night? Okay, All right. okay, people are, are rested sometimes, naps, okay. Um, <laughs> how many people are working out for at least 30 minutes, five days a week? Right, that's not 
what Dr. Fee says, that's what the College of Medicine <laughs> says. Uh-oh, no? Okay, some yes. All right, two days. Okay. All right, on the treadmill right now. Oh, okay. Get that treadmill. Get those, burn those calories. Get that respiratory system going. All right, all that to say is that our health is so connected to our hair care process. Here are some of my references, which maybe Dr. Chile can send out some of my publications over the past couple of years, which Dr. Chile read all of them, I think. <laughs> so um, I do want to conclude by saying the path to healthy hair is having strong roots. So thank you so much for allowing me to present with you all today. Here is my contact information. If you follow me on Instagram at Dr. Fia, this is my personal email account. And then my website, psychotherapy.org, so you can find out more information about how we connect hair, health, and heritage together. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask to switch back to the main screen. I want to be able to access this chat. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Fia. Um, this chat is living, though. Did, have you noticed this? This chat is like all the way live. Um, so before we move on and open it up, we've got some questions. I've been taking notes on some wonderful questions that have come up. Um, I want to show you the picture. Oh, so, okay. Um, and ask you to just respond to, um, to this picture. Um, Matthew, can you help me switch this out so I can share my screen? Let me see, maybe I can do it on my own. Yes, okay, here's my screen. Can you see this photograph? Yes, I can. Okay, okay. So this is Maryland. That's where this photograph was taken um and this photograph is from kind of the turn of the 20th century okay so I, I share what my comes what comes to mind all right okay. and also folks in the chat you know sound off what do you see here yeah well my my first reaction is that how rare this was to some degree because and i'll from what I read in a lot of enslaved populations, hair grooming was not permitted. Oftentimes, um, it, was, it was only Sundays that enslaved Africans were even allowed to groom their hair, um, that they had like the full wash day um, and had to just use a few hours on their Sunday to be able to groom and clean and you know style their hair and would have to cover it with a scarf for the rest of the week. The flip side of it, I'm imagining how healing that experience was in terms of having to work nonstop um, to, but to have the opportunity to be cared for in a loving way by other black women. Um, and the conversation that must have been happening during that experience and the private and intimate space that was required um, to be able to care for each other. So th those are my initial reaction. Yes, thank you for that. Um, let me um, stop my screen share. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I'm, I'm looking at the comments as well to kind of add to yours. Mother and child spending time, someone getting mm -hmm. hair done. This is post, this is definitely post-Civil War in terms of looking at the photographic technology mm -hmm. here. So, um, uh, someone is recalling their grandmother in Jamaica doing their hair, um, child getting her hair wrapped. Yes, it's actually hair wrapping, right? And they still do this throughout West Africa. I, I had my hair that way a couple times when I was a girl um, from my Nigerian, the Nigerian side of my life. Uh, poor baby started getting ready to start crying. Oh, I didn't see it that way, Nat. Oh, I, I saw the girl getting ready to fall asleep. Sometimes, you know, someone, their hands on your hair makes you just want to kind of like relax. And then, and then the heavy handed folks make you want to start crying. Oh. The grooming process is healing. Um, this is post enslavement, but it's almost interesting that we can't tell if this is during slavery or, or if, it's, mm -hmm. if it's after, considering going back to even the term you use, the nadir. Like the, the lowest part of our experience is really dark period um, shortly after slavery when things don't, you know, in many ways in terms of our lived experience get much better. Um, the exhaustion, yes, yeah, but despite that, they're still caring for each other, right? Um, and African women still do that, right? Generations. Um, 
Cecily Tyson and Viola Davis in that scene. That was great. Peace. Someone had the hair wrap like this in Kenya, Jamaica. So it's really, uh, this is great, guys. Because what I see is, you know, so Dr. Fia really brought forth this notion of care and relationship building and taking this downtime to be together, doing something like this and caring for themselves on these momentary and infrequent kind of opportunities that we had um, as working people, as people who were brought here as laborers. But, um, but I see so much, like we're really speaking across the diaspora. We're speaking about the continent of Africa. We've got the Caribbean here. We've got, you know what I mean? Like, I think this is great that this is a photograph from Maryland, but it's recalling all these other parts of the black world. Um, Braden on Saturday, people remembering their past. So you've got hair narratives happening in our, in our chat, which is really great. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, this is good. This is good. So, um, I am really tempted to just dominate the conversation with my questions, but I think what I'll do <laughs> is um, bring forth um, a couple of questions from the Q&A. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with the bottom. Are there as many men on as women tonight? That's an interesting question, uh, Claire. I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's, it's difficult for us to tell just based on names and just based on kind of our chat. Um, but that leads to an interesting question that I had, which is something that you mentioned in the beginning, Dr. Fia, about men and the kind of the warrior kind of returnee tradition that men have of the hair cutting and the, the ritual of like release and cleanse. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you say is the role of men in hair care as therapy? Like, is there a role for men to play in that is, you know, are, it, does, does your work really focus as much on kind of barber shops as it does on beauty shops? Yes. So, so I, I, I love this question because I think it really, um, I think sometimes we associate hair with femininity and it's not because I know my husband changes his hair way more than me. The only way that I can tell when a picture was taken is based on my husband's hairstyle because he changes it that frequently. He's had braid, braids, he's had locks, he's had bald, like all these different things, his facial hair changes. So I actually argue in a lot of my studies that men are engaged in the hair care process more often because of facial hair. Um, and I think that it's a rare time that black men get to be vulnerable with each other in the barbershop space, right? That somebody literally has a blade to their throat but how much trust they need to have in the conversation that happens in there, which is exclusive, right? That, that the conversation or tone can change when um, there are women in the space. And so it's such an opportunity for them to actually amplify their voices. So I actually have a journal article coming out in um, the psychology of men and masculinities in about a month that speaks to how the barbershop space is one of the few healing opportunities that Black men have in the U.S. Um, because of the, conver the, the narrative therapy, right? The conversations that happen. And also, again, men being able to care um, and touch gently, you know, other men um, and actually help them and um, make them feel um, handsome or attractive and um, give advice and support uh, in, in these sacred spaces. So I definitely think that, that I actually would, um, again, I'm almost arguing that men engage with hair care more, you know, going to the shop more, you know, but I think women have a different relationship with hair because of, like I was saying earlier, aesthetic trauma, the expectations um, for long hair to be feminine and how it should be worn and um, just how more policed black women's appearance, well, women's appearances in general, because I don't even want to say just black women, but women's appearances are more policed um, in terms of controlled than, than men from my perspective. So, but I think everybody has a relationship to, to hair and the aesthetics of hair. Well, thank you. Um, the next question is, and this also came up in the chat, um, you're being asked to share more about the hair autobiography, kind of speaking back to what you were just talking about, the hair autobiography in your research. Okay, yeah. So the guided hair autobiography um, 
is adapted from something called the, the guided autobiography by Dan McAdams. And so I oftentimes approach um, health and healing through a narrative approach and centralizing our identity. So I do define identity as our internalized and evolving story of self. So it's our memories. Basically, our memories and relationships make up who we are and how we see ourselves. And I definitely think that hair is a factor in how we see ourselves, especially um, people of the African diaspora. So for the guided hair autobiography, it is basically eliciting stories, detailed stories that people can tell about you know, a, a concrete event in their life that has a beginning, middle, and end. And so it's interesting to really see the range of experiences that people have as well as the patterns. So with 300, at least 300 people participating and telling these three stories about their hair, there were some real themes of hair shaming and discrimination. Um, but oftentimes, and I hate to say this, it often was the black participants, the, the bias and shaming often came from other black people. And I hate to say that because, you know, we, I think we want to make some distinction that, you know, racism or colorism um, is not much of a factor, but people's grandmothers be talking bad about their hair, <laughs> their parents hitting them with, you know, brushes and combs. I'm sure we've all heard, experienced that or heard the stories, but just like the movie, The Matrix, you know, that at any point somebody could become an agent. I think it's the same thing for white supremacy. At any point, a family member, a friend, a romantic partner, a employer, all these can be, become agents of white supremacy. So I was finding in a lot of the stories that um, there was a lot of aesthetic trauma coming from the family in particular. And so I think that that the, the hair stories were really speaking to intra-racial conflicts um yeah. and um respectability politics um and i oftentimes too think about how the stories revealed that thinness is to white women as hair is to black women mm. wow it's really guiding you know daily choices and behaviors of what to eat and how to exercise and all these different factors um so yeah that i think that's what the the stories were revealing yeah and please guys um as someone who has read all of her research articles that i possibly i i mean how i don't even know how many she's just a prolific writer um just she has snippets and excerpts from some of these guided hair autobiographies interspersed throughout her research so please follow her on on social media please like look her up um in all of the the scholarly and academic um databases because, um, I mean, it's heartbreaking, but it's so relatable for some of us, right, who have been told our hair was too nappy, too coarse, too, too African, too this, too that. Um, right. So um, we've got really a, kind of an in-house issue to deal with um, in terms of, of that, uh, letting that those kind of white ideals around hair, white aesthetic kind of infiltrate our families and cause us to be abusive toward one another. Um, Speaking of that, um, we have another question in the chat that I think is good, and then I'm going to head back into the Q&A. Um, I wanted you to talk really briefly about um, families. So Nicole raised the question about families, white families who have biracial children, or even white families who have black adopted children. Um, what advice would you give them to, in terms of learning how to treat their children's hair with respect for their heritage, which I think is important, not just the hair, but the heritage that is a part of the hair? Dr. Chile, I want you to answer that um, because yes. I, you told me a story that I cry based on how you yes. told the story about that. So I actually want to pass that back to you. Sure. Um, so I was on a field trip with a group of high school students. Um, almost all black high school students, and we took them to see Sweet Honey and the Rockin' concert in DC. And at the concert, there were a group of white parents who had adopted black children. It, was, it looked like some sort of maybe support group for the parents to get together with their children and take them to a, a black cultural event. At the let out in the lobby of the theater, um, I saw one of the black girls with her white mother and her hair was, matted not like locks but like matted 
like clumps of hair and it was it was dirty and I mean it was just really unacceptable like and 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 all and, and I couldn't help myself I know it was completely inappropriate for me I reached out and I put my hand on her hair I just touched her hair and I said you are beautiful and as soon as my hand touched her her eyes closed and she went like this and like leaned into me and 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 took my hand and like looked up into my face like I'm coming with you you know and I and and it was like no no one had touched her head mm. no one had, and she felt so rejected I mean just a moment where a complete stranger came up to her which now makes me think about all kinds of ways that she could be vulnerable to someone touching her because she hasn't been touched um so the mother I, I was talking to the mother I, so I'm also a hairstylist and a research, you know, Afi and I have collaborated on, on these issues a lot, but I, I asked the mother, you know, to take my, my number and, you know, maybe I could talk to her about hair. I was like, when's the last time you washed it? When's the last time you combed it? And she was like, oh, well, it was just, it's so difficult. It's so, you know, and she just started talking and the girl is obviously hearing all of this. The mother was just complaining about how difficult it was to get a comb through it and all this. And I'm like, do you talk like this around her? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it, and I just said, look, I, I can help. Let me, let me help. The mother just started yelling at me and snatched her daughter away. And the students surrounded us because the high school students, they were, they thought it was going to be like a fight in the lobby, <laughs> in the lobby. But, you know, we were all just saddened and really shocked by the state of the child, like the condition. And she said that there's some, the, the white mother just said that there's a black woman who helps teach them how to do hair. And she tried to learn, but she couldn't get it and just gave up. And one, I'm, this is a serious issue. Like, I think when we think about adoption and we think about interracial families, we really sometimes think, oh, well, we're all colorblind and race is just nothing. And we just, love is love. And I'm like, yeah, but this is a unique type of hair in the world. Like, I, I cried. Like, I got back on the bus with my students and we just had, we just had to unpack that on the ride back to school. I, I really feel like, it's issues like this. This is a unique form of child abuse and neglect. You know, like we have to really think about what adoption means. We have to think about birthing children who will be viewed and, and whose bodies reflect a different racial group than we're in and get training. Hair care is a tradition. Dr. Fee has talked to you, you know, throughout this presentation about this being a deep and eons old tradition. Find yourself some Black folks who know how to do hair and who are grounded in these black hair care traditions and and really spend the time learning how to do your child's hair if you're going to have the child allow your child to be comfortable in black hair care spaces and to benefit from all of the therapeutic nature of being in those spaces as much as possible and get out of your feelings about not necessarily being a part of that like the, you know all parents have to deal with their children having other lives outside of them and i think this is just one of those things that's like soul deep and this is I'll, I'll i'll stop here but when i started studying the history of black hair and i realized it was a soul deep conversation we were having that black people have literally been taught to hate their hair be you know like medieval depictions of satan in europe were of a black skinned creature with curled hair and that idea of demonic hair transported itself across the ocean with European immigrants and they immediately associated that with enslaved Africans and used that as a rationale to brutalize us and enslave us. They literally called straight hair Christian hair in this country throughout the 17th century, 18th century, and 19th century. Christian hair. So if you don't have Christian hair, what are you? Right? So that, that, that love of self through hair, that care of self through hair must be nurtured because you're literally fighting a battle that is soul deep, right? That, that we really think our hair is evil and devil, devilish, right? And so in any case, please just educate yourself and, and do it with sensitivity and, and really try to help your child be a part of its hair community. That's, that's all I got to say. Yeah, and I, you know, that, that story, um, is so moving and I'm just even seeing in the chat that that people are sharing their own um hair yeah. stress stories and traumas that this is deeply distressing and so it's interesting that the mental health field has really neglected these experiences of 
texturism or just even negative experiences in the hair care setting, right? That, that hair is literally being pulled out of the scalp by some braiders, um, you know, that, that, um, that, that hair has become weaponized in, in this society and versus how it could be so healing and medicinal. So to even um, be mindful of, of how hair looks in your own life and like we're saying, your own stories. Um, are they, they positive experiences? Are they negative? Can it be processed? Who can it be processed with? Where can you be vulnerable um, and getting your hair done and by who? Um, like I said, it's a very trusting relationship. YouTube is helpful. Um, I know I've been trying to do more unique styles that maybe I didn't try in the past, but it's really a learning process to, to study um, your hair <laughs> and what it can and can't do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Too. So please, please, really, really quickly, if you can speak about your work revolving around the Crown Act, because there's also like a kind of a professional and political implication to black hair as well. Yeah, so so it's interesting because I think every academic scholar is waiting for the day that their work becomes relevant to other people because, you know, it's so specific <laughs> sometimes. And so I was really honored to be contacted by various state senates um, and senators and representatives and even, you know, Cory Booker's team to um, utilize the psychological impacts of hair discrimination um, in people's lives. So I was able to testify in New Jersey, Wisconsin, um, and Maryland um, for the, the Crown Act as a subject matter expert. And you would be surprised how little these representatives <laughs> understand about Black hair. Even in Maryland, when I testified, they were asking questions like, well, is it clean? They're asking, right? These are the people in our state representing and creating laws and asking if black hair is clean. So just even how um, black hair is misunderstood dis and dishonored um, and just having, seeing it as a science. Um, Cause I know even in one of the most prestigious HBCUs that I used to work at, where they questioned if this was a real topic um, to study hair discrimination. Mm -hmm. I called it, and I quote, cutesy. So I think that, that um, people are now taking the conversation more seriously because it's entered politics. But, you know, it's always guided who had access to what. There's like lots of research studies saying that, you know, Black people with lighter skin or straighter hair have more access to educational opportunities, employment, um, are more likely to be married, um, even things like that. And so to really think about how hair actually is shaping access um, to resources and privileges. But, you know, it's basically speaking to the approximation towards whiteness as well in terms of what is acceptable um, and what's acceptable in education, mm -hmm. employment, and even housing. It's saying right. that it impacts access. So Right. It's, Professional it's, is code for, like, approximates white hair. Looks, yeah. And, and so we have school suspensions, expulsions. You, that was on your slideshow, actually, some of that. And um, people being dismissed from work, not hired for jobs because of that. We actually had a couple of questions in the Q&A related to that too. Um, we even had um, uh, a question about like how, how much do black women, how much pressure are they under to straighten their hair in the name of professional acceptance? Is that something they invest in? What would you say the numbers look like at this point in terms of like resources actually spent on this? Cause it's almost like a tax, a black tax that some of us feel like we have to pay in order to be considered professional and acceptable in a work in certain types of workspaces. Yeah, there, there's money, right? This is economic. This, this is capitalist. Um, you know, the, the, the black hair care industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. And even to the say, even though there's, you know, the whole second natural hair movement, um, about 60 to 70% of black women in the U.S. still chemically straighten their hair. And so we know that that's very expensive and toxic, but just even the process of um, 
straightening hair is expensive adding hair is expensive dyeing hair is expensive um and so there yeah i just think about the money and the marketing associated with these things too right Right. And then the fact that um, I think I, I, I heard and correct me if I'm wrong, 40 percent of black women, black women exercise 40 percent less than other women because of not wanting to sweat and, you know, ruin the straightened hairstyles and stuff like that. And so it is it has like all kinds of health impacts, right, health, health outcomes. And um, we had um, a, a comment. Uh, Joanne Kim and someone also in the Q&A raised the question about the relationship between Black communities and the, the Asian beauty supply store, uh, the Korean beauty supply store, the other Asian beauty supply store. Um, she works at one, Joanne does, and kind of tried to educate her family on what she knew, or the, the, family, the Asian family that ran the store. But like, what would you, because there's been a lot of tension around that lately. So what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that the, from from what I found about um, ninety percent of black hair care supply stores are owned by Koreans, um, and so what happened that black people, of course, made and created their own hair products and tools, but um, Asian Asian communities will come and study to see how we were spending our money and saw that we were spending it on hair, and so we're able to you know get these wholesale prices and create cheaper and actually more toxic um, products for black hair. And so it's, yeah, it, it, it's, um, it's a, it, yeah, I, I'm feeling at a loss. You're trying to be nice. You're trying to be, <laughs> you're trying to be diplomatic. It's, yeah, I hate. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, expo it's an a, a exploitation of um, the Black aesthetic, right, in terms of understanding how money is spent and creating um, opportunities for the money to be spent in those spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I I'm referencing the wholesale prices. Um, just like, you know, my, one of my favorite books is Our Black Year um, that speaks to um, how Black dollars travel uh in the community and outside of it but it, it speaks to even grocery stores i would even liken hair care supply beauty supply stores to grocery stores that you know in the early 1900s maybe there were like three thousand black owned grocery stores and then in like 2010 there's like three so in the country and so i think that it kind of speaks to that same piece of you know black people being pushed out of um these economic opportunities. Yeah. So wherever we can, we we um, we do try to support Black hair care products and Black owned beauty supply stores. Although we can count them on one hand, Black owned <laughs> beauty supply stores, right? Yes. Um, yeah, we can't um, get huh? Saying we can't get the loans. Right. Where they actually exist. And yeah. right, because it's not that the the effort is not there. It's that from an economic perspective, when we're dealing with loans and, and renting spaces and acquiring those same wholesale relationships, it's not the same, right? Um, I do want to, I do want to affirm that black beauty salons and barbershops are one of the most thriving businesses that we've ever had, right? There used to be this app um, that I would use to find different black owned businesses. And I would put in bank and it would say like, like maybe one industrial bank or I put in um, laundromat or, you know, dry cleaner and there'd be three or four, but I put in barbershop or beauty salon, and it would be like 90, you know, in DC. Mm -hmm. So I do recognize that we do own the salons and barbershops, but don't actually own the, the product stores or the supply store. So that's even an interesting dichotomy. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to stay on top of all these amazing questions in the Q&A. Um, you can see it too, right? Do you yeah. want to just kind of move through them? I'm trying to organize the conversation in a way to kind of keep yeah, with wigs. the flow. But... About wigs. So I think let's speak to the international, right? So there, there are some differences in the way the African American versus Caribbean versus, you know, continental African people where they're hair um i know that when i went to nigeria uh i was so surprised i had never seen this in the u.s that i saw 
a woman giving another woman um, a weave using a flashlight because, you know, the electricity will be going out at night. But it wasn't like, okay, because we don't have electricity, we'll stop. But there's so much more marketing. And you all can challenge me on this. On the continent for wigs and weaves, um, then I feel like I see in, you know, most American cities, by going to Kenya, that there would be huge billboards about get this straight weave and wig. Um, where those, those styles we wouldn't even wear here. And so I'm very mindful of the role of colonization, right? And shaping um, what is attractive and what is high status and who gets the jobs. Um, there's a, I feel like the wig and weave culture, and you can challenge me, is sh stronger and more um, pervasive on the continent than the US. That was just my experience because of just, again, the, the expectation. Yeah. That, um, so, and then I've, I've done some research in Cuba. That's probably the place that I've actually done studies. I have um, an article called, and my Spanish isn't great, but no toques mi pelo. Mm -hmm. And so uh, don't touch my hair. And so just even thinking about how Afro-Cuban identity can be negotiated with hair because they have so many um, embargoes that a lot of Cub Black Cuban women don't have quality hair products. They're getting the products from um, countries that will trade with them. And oftentimes they're the ones that, you know, cause hair to fall out and these different things. And that natural hair movement kind of looks very different in Cuba that, that if you think about it, the, the U.S. embargoes of like the 1950s, that's when everybody had perms. Men had perms, women had perms, black women, right? When we think about like the movie Malcolm X. So going to Cuba, like the men had perms, they had, or straighten it, like it was conked. I'm like, y'all are still doing that. But to them, that's the last contact they had with like the broader world when everybody was straightening their hair. So I feel like it, it really, you know, is shaped by colonization, access to resources and media and things like that. Um, so it's even interesting, or, or it can even be protective, right? So I see in the chat that, that wigs and weaves can be protective styles. Um, but I read a really good book yesterday called Beyond the Braids that spoke to how a lot of protective styles can be harmful to black hair if you're not actually taking care of your hair. Healthy hair, from this book that I read yesterday, healthy hair is a prerequisite to getting a wig or a weave. Healthy hair is a prerequisite to having braids because if the hair is already vulnerable, then it's gonna make things worse. So it's kind of like the opposite. You think protective styles, oh, I'm not manipulating my hair, but if the hair is uncared for for weeks or months at a time, it's actually gonna have worse outcomes in, in the installation, the, in the takedown of it, that there can be so much hair loss and damage from that. So to even think, I wanna emphasize this, this is my new talking point, that protective hairstyles aren't always protective. So even if, you know, a lot of celebrities are using wigs or weaves because they're con they were co probably constantly having to straighten or, you know, style their hair that in that sense it can be, but it's not necessarily um, serving that purpose. Mm -hmm. I think also when it comes to other countries, um, in addition to kind of the, the contours of like colonial and neo-colonial history and their availability of these, you know, the availability of black hair care products in the marketplace, I think there's also this, this um, the different timelines of the kind of black consciousness movements and the black is beautiful movements. Like I think there's, no matter whether we were directly or our parents or grandparents were directly involved in the black is beautiful movement here in this country, there's echoes of it that we've all kind of been exposed to. So we know even if we want straight hair, we want to emulate white folks, we want to wear weaves and wigs. I think there's still that little black conscious voice in the back of our head that says, you shouldn't want this though, because this might mean you don't, you hate yourself. You might be a sellout. You know, there's there's that voice that we still hear that makes us at least pause and critique. Whereas in other countries, like you know, going to Nigeria, there's it's like, no, when you when you finally grow up, when you start to straighten your hair, it's a sign of being an adult, a professional. Someone's moved to, moving into a new class, right? And and there's there's not the same shame that that little voice is not necessarily there in the same way in other in other countries. Um, so yeah. yeah, and even to, again, going back to the concept of hair loss, I'm very mindful, you know, that if we don't have the time or the money or the nutrients or, you know, that, or the health yeah. that, that I know my grandmothers wore wigs, right? In terms of yeah. 
one one grandmother had a hip surgery, took a medication, and her hair never grew back again. And so just to even be mindful that that it's often co sometimes covering up health related concerns yeah. um, leads to those disparities as well. Yeah, sometimes it's just a matter of convenience. We work. Sometimes throwing on a wig for some women is like throwing on a scarf. Like I don't have time to do my hair. I just gotta go, you know. So yeah. Um, question about I'm trying to tie in two of the questions from the Q and A about recommendations for kind of intervention, therapeutic intervention in your home where hair is being done and also in the workplace when you see maybe some traumatic hair experiences happening, maybe a workplace buddy or a colleague is being bullied or kind of discriminated against or someone says something inappropriate about someone's hair. Do you have recommendations for interventions so that we can kind of counteract hair trauma? Okay, okay. Well, I would definitely recommend ritual, hair care rituals. So one um, way to make sure that you're doing a ritual is to engage all of your senses in the hair care process. So that means that when you're doing your hair, you should be listening to certain sounds, whether it's Nina Simone, like we started out today, or just you know meditation music or Beyonce, whatever it is, but I think listen to something that feels soothing and good to you. I think that it's important to have hair products that smell really good, that um, you know whether it has lavender in it, which can be very relaxing, or rosemary, which can stimulate the hair follicles, all these different things. Um, so the smell is very important because I know. Um, do you remember ever going to uh, <laughs> PG Plaza and it used to smell like burnt hair? Did yes. <laughs> the mall. Like, but burnt hair does not smell good. It smells horrible. I know in the few times that I've gotten my hair blow dried um, and sleeping, my husband's like, oh, like in the bed, he's like, it smells like he can't take, take the smell. So thinking about the hair products that smell really good. Um, I think it's also important to have enough time. I find that I tend to rip my hair out when I'm rushing to do my hair instead of sectioning, sectioning it into small pieces and going through and really properly detangling with wide tooth comb and having enough conditioner and all of that, but to have enough time to schedule it, to schedule it, um, put it on your calendar, put it on your phone. Um, I think another piece is, um, so even look at something. So sometimes people watch YouTube videos or watch maybe Black is King or something as you do your hair to get some hair inspo, but to, you know, thinking about the visuals. So again, engaging like all of our senses um, during the process, do, doing your own scalp massage um, to really like stimulate yourself and that sounded weird, but like stimulate your scalp and kind of get this sort of like arousal and blood flow even going on up here. So I think that, that that's, that's a big part of it um, mm -hmm. in terms of being gentle with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, okay, work-related stress, hair stress. And, and there's a related question that Tammy just put in there, how white women can show up in solidarity to black women in the workplace, since we're, you're currently thinking about workplace hair stress and trauma. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of HR. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, so you can, you can say it's gender-based discrimination, Title III. You know, like you can actually say that, that um, even if your state or location doesn't, you know, isn't enacting the Crown Act, but to, to have informal confrontations. I've had white women touch my hair at work, and you better believe they never touch it again just by looking at them like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? I remember at Catholic University where I used to work, I was the only black person at the counseling center, and, and a white woman was like, oh, your hair is so beautiful, put her hands in it, and I turned so fast and stared she apologized profusely. Oh my gosh, what did I do? I'm so wrong. Why did I do that? Just even, um, you know, my grandmother had it down, but she had the look. And so I think that that's even can be sometimes that first step that like, do we have a problem here? Um, yeah. But but I think that, you know, actually having conversations about it, the professional development, you know, we talk about sexual harassment and work, but the same thing can happen with hair harassment and to mm -hmm. make common um, language and to actually put words to what you're experiencing. Um, I think that we need to decode some of these policies that we have about 
uniforms and dress codes to see how it's, you know, perpetuating certain white ideals of beauty versus um, embracing a range of phenotype and expression. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah get your workplace to examine here uh, professional look policies. Absolutely. Do that in schools with your children. Um, I, my, over, my overall philosophy there is speak softly in your home about hair and speak sternly in public about your hair. Like that's, that's been my general policy. When, 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 I, do, when I do hair, so I'm the hair doer in my family. So all the nieces, all the cherries, it, when somebody, it, and I try to get them all in at the same time. So it's just hair day and, and all the look babies, we get the hair done and I take pictures and I'm like, you look fabulous. And I just affirm, you know what I mean? If they don't get it at home, which they do, but if they don't get it at home, they get it at Auntie Ellie's house. And, but then if I go in the workplace and someone wants to treat me like a petting zoo, now I, I work at PG Community College. It's a, it's a, it's a largely, there's a lot of black folks at this campus. So I don't really have that issue, but like, you know what I mean? But if, but you know, that's obviously happened before. And I'm just like, like you did like that quick turn you said, and, and really go to the policies and say, look, first of all, you can't touch me. Don't touch me. That's a violation. And then second of all, like really address the fact if you hear someone saying something obscene about someone's hair or rude about someone's hair, you can affirm that person, you can affirm that person's hair, and you also can, you know, send those per my email, you know, send an email, <laughs> a nice stern email talking about, you know, to HR or whomever saying that you witnessed something that you found offensive. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways that you can stand up for your fellow people, um, whether you are Black or not, um, against these aggressions. And I wouldn't even say these are microaggressions. They're only microaggressions to people who don't live in these bodies. They're full on aggressions that people stay up at night and think about and, you know, pe people are frustrated by and people are enraged by. So they're not micro, you know what I mean? I think, in some, so um, I, yeah, there's I, lots of ways. Oh, that's my mom in the chat, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> my niece is saying hello auntie ellie okay and thank you for the wonderful style oh <laughs> okay um do you have any more questions in the q a that you might like to get at I dr know. I, I i know in my head i wanted us to end at 7 30 but like i really feel like the, the there's so much energy here i want to make sure we get as much of this out as possible i am so enjoying this um the things people are sharing in the chat are just brilliant we've had links to to videos and resources. We've had people sharing narratives. Yeah, yeah. This is great. There, there, there are definitely ways to um, speak about hair. I'm looking, you know, for, for white attendees, mm -hmm. please consider hiring Dr. Chile and I to come and speak to your job. Um, we can have one-on-ones with you if you want to be an anti-texturist. Um, wait, is that the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. Texturism. And we've done this presentation together before, by the way. We, we've done this very soon. Yeah, so, so um, really considering, um, you know, cite Black women um, in, in the research that we're, we're doing, um, yeah, through various Google searches uh, about the language of hair. Um, oh my yeah, there's gosh, so many done. things I'm reading fast enough, but yeah, we done brought up Fanon. Someone raised the question about Fanon in your research and, um, uh, any good books. You've been recommending a couple of really good books, but who are your main, like you mentioned some of your inspirations for kind of your definitions of mental health, but like what books could people, um, be reading and, and and what books kind of inspire you in terms of kind of your racial kind of theoretical frameworks? Also, there's a couple of folks in the q and I think you might want to just kind of address individually that kind of have more specific, like Christiane is talking about her group of artists, funders, and Black therapists, um, and this healthcare voucher, mental health care voucher that I think sounds really interesting. But um, yeah, who do you read? Is Franz Fanon one of the people you've read for this kind of work? Yes, I have. Um... So France Fanon, um, I even like, surprisingly, I have books on my desk right now. I even like this book, <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a commercial. Um, the Body Keeps the Score 
um, brain, mind, and body in the healing of trauma. So even thinking about how some of, um, some of our, our trauma can even manifest um, related to hair. I like um, the book Hair Story by um, Ayana Bird and Lori Tharps. I like um, Dr. Joy DeGruy, um, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Um, I like Dr. Uh, Kamara Jules Harrell, um, Manishian Psychology, um, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, Isis Papers. Um, I like to read Dr. Thomas Parham, uh, The Psychology of Black and counseling persons of African descent. I'm going to have to send like a whole reading. Yes. List. Also, oh. um, you, you, she actually really does some wonderful um, Instagram stories where she features certain books that she's reading about certain topics. Like it's really, really neat and well-organized kind of thematically. Like just get you some, okay? Just follow her on Instagram if you have Instagram because there's always a book and she kind of ties it in with kind of her vibe for the day, her personal experience for the day. Um, and you will have a very long book list just by scrolling through um, there and, and looking at what she's reading. She's always sharing that. So, um, oh, to, okay, there's another question. Mental health being white centered. Is that why only half of black female patients return to therapy or some other reason, do you think? Yeah, it, it, it's not necessarily the way we heal. When I think about my most healing experiences in life, it wasn't from a therapist. And I've gone to therapy, right, as a therapist, but to think about having um, a relationship is part of the healing process. Um, so I think that, you know, part of Western approaches to mental health is to go to a complete stranger and you're expected to share all this private information about yourself and your family versus some, the research kind of shows the opposite for black women in particular, then knowing the person allows you to open up more and share more details um, and feel comfortable with them versus, you know, having to be defensive and things like that. So, yeah. Um, I'm still getting more reading list questions. Okay, so another thing I'm going to ask Dr. Fia to do before we uh, wrap up, I'm, I'm going to try to give us another maybe 10 minutes, is to show her list of articles. One of the things that you might want to do when you go to Dr. Fia's research and read her, her publications, her articles, is look in her list of references. Because a lot of these sources and books that she's mentioned to you are also in her list of references, her work cited at the end of her, her, her own research. Um, and she reviews some of these books and discusses them in her lit reviews as well. Um, two questions that, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I said I'm about to copy, oh, it doesn't let you copy and paste? I don't know. I don't know. Um, two, two questions keep coming up regarding specifically hair. And that's the question of hair loss. Do you have any recommendations around that? We talked about hair loss as a function of, you know, stress and diet it's, or diet, dietary deprivation, right? But um, what do you have recommendations related to that? Um, anything that kind of you've seen work for people throughout your work research? And then also this question of the categories of text, hair textures, the three okay. C, the four F, which is what I got, <laughs> you know, like this, and this is, this is weave, by the way, guys, this is not my hair. This is twisted into my own real hair. Cause y'all know I look different last month. Um, and you know, you know, but, but I do have me and Dr. Fee have different hair textures. What's, what's that all about? All right. So the hair typing system developed by, um, Walker, uh, Andre Walker, yeah, um, basically speaks to curl patterns and um, like the density of the hair. So it was originally designed to help with hair product choice. Um, but of course, no one really has one hair texture. Actually, you know, we have a variety of hair textures even on our scalps. I know I have different hair here versus the back of my hair and um, these different factors, but it essentially was supposed to um, guide hair choices. But I think a bigger guide for hair choice, hair care product choices is porosity. That's my personal approach that how does your hair react to water? Because the only thing that can moisturize hair is water. Everything else just seals it in the conditioners, the oils, and to understand how does your hair react to water can speak to your product choices. Because for people who have low porosity, that's like having a window that is shut versus people who have high porosity, that's like a window that's open in terms of um, 
like the hair cuticle, uh, being able to access water. Some people need their hair steamed versus some people, if you have high porosity, might drench it too much. So it's, it's a conversation about water. That's my personal perspective, but I think that the hair typing system has, you know, perpetuates a caste system and type typing and um, those sort of things. But um, that's my my review of why it was supposed to have been made in terms of how to care for your hair. But I think that porosity is a more sophisticated way. So the, understand your hair porosity. If you take a hair hair out of your head, put it in a glass of water. Does it flow? Does it sink? Does it, you know, all these different things. Does it curl up? Does it stay straight? Um, that That's a way for you to actually get a better understanding of how your hair reacts to water. Right. Unfortunately, it seems like the hair categories tend to reinforce texturism, where yeah. the, the looser your curl pattern, the closer it is to straight, the better you're, you have gooder and gooder hair. And then, you know, the tighter the curl, the more dense your hair, that's toward the bad hair that's more African we don't like that and 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 so yeah unfortunately it's like we've inscribed our the trauma of kind of white aesthetics and anti-African aesthetics onto a categorization system that was meant to help but yeah and then for hair loss so so um hair loss comes from a variety of things right and it's really important to meet with a physician a dermatologist in particular to get an assessment sometimes when we do our own hair or even use things like co-wash we're not seeing that there's extreme buildup on our scalps and so only seeing a hair care professional or a dermatologist can actually help with the assessment of what's going on um, hair loss can again be caused by nutrition, genetics, right? So genetics, that's a major part of hair loss. Um, there's CCCA, there's um, alopecia areata, there's different types of alopecia, there's, you know, hair loss connected to um, chemotherapy and radiation, all these different factors. So I would actually lean more towards consult, consulting an MD um, to see what what is going on. And so sometimes they can take actual um, uh, scalp biopsy to see what's going on on a chemical level, even you know, test things genetically. I work with a few physicians like Dr. Monty Harris in um, Bethesda who um, addresses hair loss, um, Dr. Shoshana Kindred in Columbia, Maryland. So I work with a few physicians where we share patients um, because you know, hair loss can have a huge psychological impact. And so um, we're even starting some hair loss support groups um, to address some of, of the needs that come up, but there, there are a variety of factors. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions in the um, itchy scalp? Yeah, that I think that, yeah, that you can, I mean, of course, address that if you'd like. I'm just trying to look through the Q&A and see if there's some other major stuff we haven't. Yeah, so, so it sounds like the scalp is irritated. Um, and again, that could be from a variety of concerns, but I'm just even thinking about hydration, right? Water, um, how much, uh, how is the, cal the scalp getting clean before the product application? Mm -hmm. um, I know at the salon that we worked at, we use a, a series of, sh through, through the shampoo process, starting with a clarifying shampoo that really strips. Um, the hair of a lot of the product buildup. Then we use a moisturizing shampoo. We use a conditioner. So it's like a series of things to replenish. Um, so yeah, there could be lot, lots of factors. Dandruff, you know, sometimes people think dandruff is um, dry scalp. It is not. It's actually scalp that has too much oil on it and it's the dead skin is sticking to the scalp and creating that the flakes for dandruff. So it's actually addressing the oil levels or sebum, which is the scalp's natural oil, and to be able to regulate that through certain diets or you know cleaning um, the scalp in a certain way. Yeah, apple cider vinegar is really good for clarifying and making sure that that sebum is kind of neutralized. Um, yeah. Um, Drinking a lot more water is going to help with basically all of the issues. I'm sorry, I, I'm, answer, I'm jumping in there answering questions. Um, aha! I, I, I didn't pour enough. I'm done with mine already, but I'm going to get some more. But yeah, absolutely. Drinking water is going to solve a lot of um, a lot of your hair issues, all, all your issues, right? <laughs> so absolutely, because um, that's like a major factor for me. Like I, I think for, for me, that was a major factor. 
Um, yeah, I, dehydrated. Yeah. I know I know I'm chronically dehydrated. I never seem to get enough water, but mm -hmm. I'm working on it. Um, so that's one of my hair goals <laughs> to Same. drink more water. Same hair goals about drinking more water. Um, are there any kind of thoughts that you would like to leave us with that things that maybe you didn't put in your presentation, but like kind of some some takeaways that you would like folks to think about as it relates to hair heritage and history and healing and okay okay um i'm gonna do a shameless plug okay so in october i will be doing some emotional first aid classes through psychotherapy so my website psychotherapy.org um i am going to be offering classes for how people can take care of their emotional health um so oftentimes you know in school we learn if someone's choking how to do the heimlich maneuver or maybe even we took like a cpr class at some point um, for our careers but oftentimes we never address how to take care of a panic attack or how to cope when you've experienced a loss so for the month of october through um the psychotherapy website, I'm actually gonna be offering trainings on how to survive guilt, how to manage rejection, how to cope with failure, all these different things, these emotional wounds that sometimes if neglected can become inflamed. And so um, learning skills to be able to take care of your mental health and those around you. Um, so being the first you know, responder <laughs> for emotional crises. So I wanna make sure that it's not limited to mental health providers, but communities of care to be able to address, you know, our mental health related to all the things that are happening right now. Um, so it will be virtual classes. So you can look up um, psychotherapy and look at the emotional first aid classes. Yay. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. You are a resource. You are a, a powerhouse of a scholar and just so necessary, so timely. Um, thank you. I hope we all we were able to address um, at least the majority of your questions community um, um, that were in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to post right now the link to um, oh gosh, if I can find it, the link to um, the actually I won't um, you can find the recording of this session and also the first one that we did back in August on the PGCC TV YouTube channel. So PGCC TV, um, actually will, uh, they are recording this session for us. They've been so wonderful, uh, helping us do all the tech stuff. And, uh, within a week or so this session and the, the will be uploaded onto PGCC TV on YouTube. The other one is already there. If you look, um, so if you or someone else, you know, missed the one from August 28th, you're welcome to go there and check it out. Um, and all of the other ones will be there. Please join us again, um, in October, October 30th for our next speaker. Um, this is just, I, I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know how to thank you for this. This was just really wonderful. Such a great learning experience. I even learned some new stuff from you today um the community thank you all so much for putting all of your energy and your thought and your care and concern into these the this chat like you all are experts in your own right you are critical thinkers you are doing so many wonderful things to help i'm so glad that the african-american studies institute at pgcc could bring this to you all and and that we can be here together doing this this very important work it's intellectual it's social it's cultural it's it's right on time and so necessary um yeah, I, I don't even, I don't know. I don't, I don't even want to end. I don't want to go nowhere. Ah. Um, <laughs> but um, if you have any further questions, please send me an email. Um, and you can contact me at aasi.pgcc at gmail.com, aasi.pgcc at gmail.com. And Dr. Thea's information is there. We put her IG in the chat. Um, and stay safe and healthy. Be good and gentle to yourselves and all of those around you. And we will see you next time. Good night, everyone. <laughs>